you know, I, I, on my part, I try to make people just aware of, of the history of the church. We have old pictures and, and just, I, I think that kind of groundedness can be positive. Um, so I, I try to help, help people, at least the converts coming in, give them an, an understanding, like they're, they're taking on a baton, you know, yeah. here and they have the, you know, as these, these folks were faithful in making sure that the church is there, um, though those families are pretty much gone, it's their turn, you know, to be that, to be that. Welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and tonight we have Father Turbo Qualls and Father Zachariah. Cyprian could not be here tonight, and Father Zachariah graciously uh, decided to come on as another guest so that we could talk about some stuff. But first, Father, I'll allow you to introduce yourself, but first, as an icebreaker, because I usually ask a little icebreaker question just to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, between you two, in a silly way, what was something embarrassing that you guys did coming into the church that you didn't know was wrong? But so, for example, mine was when I first started praying, not, I didn't know, I only had an icon of St. Dismas and I prayed all of my prayers to that. And I didn't know you're supposed to have an icon of Christ and the mother of God, you know? So, and I would, he was, I would slide him underneath my TV and then slide him back out when I wanted to pray with him. It's just one of those things looking back, I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, it's, it's fine, whatever. But it's one of those things. And, uh, you know, little things like, I don't know, a million little like things that you don't know coming into the church. So, yeah, what was something you guys did? Go ahead, Father. Me first, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to had to really think of. I mean, I probably did a lot. There was so much, like you said, to learning that needs needs to be done. So much change. I mean, I came out of uh, Protestant evangelical, more of the charismatic background. Um, so I, I think uh, lear learning, re you know, some of the reverence. You know, not not. Uh, you know, I definitely. Because evangelical, you know, it came out of vineyard and it's very casual, super mm -hmm. casual. And that's, that's kind of the, that's the ethos. It's, you know, that's the way it is, you know. So um, I think learn, learning that reverence and learning, learning to, uh, to see that. I'd have to kind of pick my brain to remember back because it's been 20 years to some, some little detail. But just generally speaking, I think that's, that's really something I had to, to learn early on. Well, I have I have one more story just to make up for that. You know, I'll throw myself <laughs> under the bus here. This that I was sweating and just red faced the car ride home after this. But uh, I was a catechumen and a priest went to just go shake my hand. It was not even a big deal. Just He was just being very casual. I just grabbed his hand and like kissed it really hard. Like it, it was not necessary. It was not appropriate for the setting. It might have even been his left hand for all I know. Like I just like grabbed a hand and just yanked it and kissed it really quick. And all the people, it was at like a pan-Orthodox thing during Lent. And all the people I from my church that saw me do that were and like all like turned away. And like not really. They were very everyone was very gracious about it. But the ride home, I was just like sweat and just like I was like, oh my gosh, that was that was not it. So Father, what about Father Turbo? What about you? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of in the same spot father is it's like I'd have to like kind of think back on it. I'm going to go the other direction and say I made that mistake um, that people still make. And I came in too prepared, thinking I knew too much. Mm -hmm. I had the fasting rule down the prayer rule down I had done all this, even before the advent of kind of like in an orthodoxy I had to really I'd really done a lot of research at least I thought I did, and I kind of came in ready to tell the fathers what the plan was and so really quick you know I got dressed down in a very good way but 
uh, it's not about my plan, you know? So uh, like a good example was Father Michael, you know, I was like, I'm ready to fast and this and that. And Father Michael just kind of looked at me. He's like, okay, no fasting for you. And I was just, I was scandalized, you know, but I'm thankful um, because he really kind of chopped me at the knees in the way that I needed it. So I Amen. think that's what I would say. I kind of came in too hot and heavy, too, too trigger happy, you know? Amen. Amen. And I think that's, especially coming from a Protestant world, that lack of reverence, it just doesn't, it does come naturally after a while yeah. but for that, for that first couple months you just like what do i do here why am mm -hmm. i doing this i don't understand why i'm doing this so um it's definitely a tricky transition and my heart goes out to people who are making that transition because that was a rough time rough but good but like really really good very very beneficial well it's funny because it's the beginning of the purification process in a lot of ways you know it, it brings us into a humility that we're just not used to in our in our current culture, you know this yeah. this understanding of needing to humble yourself to a way of being, a way of thinking, a way of acting. Um, it's just so foreign to us, um, and so even just that very initial process starts purification and gets us to get outside of ourselves. So I mean, the more embarrassing, really, the better, you know. Yeah. <laughs> So. Well, I'm never going to yank a priest's hand again. So <laughs> just like, it's a good learning. It's a good learning thing. Yeah. And yeah, being uncomfortable and choosing to be uncomfortable. That's just not something a Western Protestant is ever used to. So, so Father Zachariah, before we delve into our topic and we have a, a topic, would you mind talking a little bit about yourself? Just the elevator pitch of what's going on? Elevator pitch. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm a, I have a small parish um, in Pueblo, Colorado, um, Archangel Michael's. Um, so most people kind of, if it, someone's heard, heard my name, it's connected to a small blog I have called the Impulse Pin. Um, and so that's, and I just write there on various topics that I've usually that I find interesting. I've taught, you know, I mix um, the, uh, the proverbial religion and politics on that blog. So uh, try to examine, I try to examine things that are happening in the world uh, from the ortho, from through the lens of, of orthodoxy, through Christianity to understand the signs of the times. Mm. I, I think that's important for us. I mean, whatever is going to happen, you know, whether is, is well, we, ha we have to be wise in our time. I know this is the time in which we live. This is the time in which we dwell. This is where Christ has put us as everyone else before us in the times in which they found themselves. And they had to know the times where, where they were living, and what was happening, the spirit of the age, um, and how to live in Christ and to uphold the, um, Christ and the truth in, in those times. Uh, so, so I, I don't know, that's... Perfect, perfect. How long have you been out in Colorado? Uh, I've been, I was on and off, I've been on and off in Colorado a bit. I was originally born in Colorado, so um, uh, let's see. But I've been back as the pastor, the priest uh, here at uh, for almost it'll be it'll be twelve years this June. Uh, so, you know. Okay. Well, so, forgive me. Uh, it put you on the spot there, Father, and it's it's terrible. Uh, and it didn't do you justice. Let me do you a little bit of justice. Okay, no, that's it. That's so, no. so let me give some context uh, for everybody. You know, Father Zachariah, his his blog um, um, has been and was instrumental to a lot of people very early on in trying to um, find some bearings in what was happening in the midst of all the confusion and chaos. What's the name of that blog again, Father? The English Pen. The English Pen. I'm going to say, we're going to say it one more time, rule of threes. So That's right. So uh, it's just important to, to bring this context out because, um, you know, Father Zachariah was, you know, one of the very few priests, you know, obviously everyone knows what Father Peter hears, but Father Zachariah was hitting a lot of channels, uh, kind of proverbially speaking, um, and really reaching some of us that that really needed it at a certain time and he did it in a way that allowed you to kind of enter in at your own pace which is really helpful um and subsequently you know 
his um, background. And of course, this is this will come up, you know, but, um, you know, uh, if it's OK to say your Mashka is Ukrainian, right, father, you know, and so mm. um, so father's background, not just in regards of um, his spiritual kind of pedigree and his willingness to um, have integrity in his priesthood and have integrity in his ministry, but also too on a personal level has been invaluable. I know to me and to many others, not just in regards to the light of um, COVID, but even transhumanism um, and really a lot of the, the, a lot of the movements and the pieces that are getting moved by the principalities and the powers, you know, even early on, if you remember, Andrew, you know, I shared, you know, two or three of his blog posts through uh, the email to the parish. You yeah. Know? Oh, yeah, that I, was him. Okay. He, he didn't know his father, but it was him. And, sure. and uh, he was really instrumental in allowing an articulation of certain things that as, as, a, as a priest and as a pastor of a community, he allowed me a, a little bit of distance to talk about some difficult things in the time of those trials where everyone was really confused. And he was a kind of objective voice that I think allowed a lot of the, the community to hear kind of what was going on and in a way that I felt they weren't necessarily hearing from me at the time. Mm. And so putting those out, I think, I, I know helped a few of the brothers and a few of the people through the email to kind of read it and to kind of step outside of the hot box of the community. Cause you know, it's, it's like a family, right? Sure. It's like, okay, if, dad's, if dad that. says something, it's like, eh, you don't wanna listen to dad. So he allowed Father Zachariah kind of became the guy in the street that was saying the same thing that I was trying to say, but in a way that I, th I think a lot of the brothers and others needed to hear it to kind of accept it in a different way. So for that, I'm really thankful to you, Father, um, for your ministry. And I just kind of want to set that up and, and give everyone a little bit more of a, of a richer context of who you are and your ministry. Oh, thank you, Father. That was essential. I would just like to say a good example is that Papadia, father's wife, has been trying to get his her son, their son, into Dr. Braca for a very long time. Now here comes cool Andrew, plays at first pastor one time. He's like, hey, Dr. Braca is awesome. And she's like, oh, whatever, whatever. So um, speaking of Ukraine, because they're from Ukraine, uh, that's kind of what we wanted to talk about, what was going on over there tonight, or uh, what's going on over there talk about it tonight so um i'm gonna let you gentlemen kick it off because i am not nearly as informed as either one of you um and i'm a little bit informed and i'll chime in every once in a while but if you guys wouldn't mind starting because i would quickly get out of my depth on that so sure sure father if you don't mind i'll just kind of like jump in with you a little bit you yeah, know and and set it up just generally speaking father you know um i don't know about across the board but i would say a good portion of, of our audience or the people who, who you know, are kind of uh, consistent with us, they'll tend to find themselves um, definitely on, on, on one side of the conflict with Ukraine. Um, and obviously in the side, you know, that sees um, the, the obvious canonical issues going on there um, and obvi the obvious kind of Western hand involved. Um, and even, you know, the way that so much of the um, kind of accoutrement of the left and the liberal side is tied up with it. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, you can almost guess. It's like if someone fell on one side of the argument, whether it was transgenderism, COVIDism, BLM, whatever the thing is, they're probably Ukraine, they're probably, you know, NPC, right? NPC yeah. culture. Um, and so our audience is, you know, really keyed into that for the most part. And um, I want I want you to really feel comfortable kind of as much as you can jumping in as high of a level as you want to, because the 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 crux, I mean, Royal Path, the crux that we always try to maintain is, is the nuance of the reality. So we try to really show that the the polarization in itself is a trap. Right. And the polarization left or right is a trap, not just by the powers that be politically civically but by the power, the powers the principalities the fallen powers right. so um i i've been really keen on understanding that there's a human reality to this yes that um even in regards of you know schismatics and all the terrible things that are happening 
you know, demonic liturgies inside the lava, these things, mm -hmm. you're still dealing with human beings, meaning the Ukrainians, you know, you're still yes. dealing with people who are suffering and in their own way have their own blind spots because it's their nation and all these things. And so they're caught up in a trap. Same thing with a Russian who would be caught up in a trap, right? And there is a there is a truth which will let's dive into all of it. The truth of the canonical, the canonical and non canonical structures. Mm. Let's dive into, you know, illegal and illicit influence from Western powers. All of that. But I just want to kind of set that up and let you know, just as deep and high levels you want to go. Just kind of lead us, and we'll follow. So, what are your thoughts on everything? You're officially off the chain. You can you can do what you got to do, <laughs> and we'll support you in that. Oh man, we'll do everything but blur out your face. You know, there you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, well, I think you, Father, you hit on something that's very important to remember, and it gets it gets very obscured in these things, and that that you that we're dealing with with people, with humans, broken humans, um, and we're all struggling with sin, and we see this, and I think really. We have to take response, all of us, starting in Orthodox, we'll just start with Orthodoxy, where we're at. But we all have to start, you know, take responsibility and repentance for what's happening, because the church is a body, it's a living organism, and we're all part of that. Um, and in some sense, in a strange way, you know, because of this, you know, the internet here, we are talking in different states, you know, globalization, you know, in times past, maybe if I was in my little village, you know, which I'm in my little village here in Colorado, or, you know, large village, whatever, uh, I wouldn't, news wouldn't reach me until who knows when about some event elsewhere in the world. Um, but now I hear about it immediately on my phone. It's just kind of this paradigm in which we find ourselves. Um, but in the church, really, so we know about these things constantly. I mean, I pick up my phone, I would go to the, you know, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church telegram, and I look at what's happening, you know, the daily updates. But I think the, you know, this, we have to start with, it's a, it's reflecting a brokenness. Uh, I think really, a lot, uh, you know, sadly, what's, what's, what's kind of scary to me in my starting my own heart is that, you know, the, the Lord warns us, he says, if you lose your salt, you'll be worthless, you know. Mm. Um, and I think there we see, we see a lot of good good things speaking, but speaking generally, we see this real tribulation um, in orthodoxy in Christianity, true Christianity, um, an attack on the salt. And the more we lose our salt, the more the world goes crazy. And that's mm. a spiritual reality that I think we have to own. That the world is going mad to some degree because uh, we as you know, in various ways, which we maybe can, you know, we'll see how it goes. But you know, we're we're we've we've uh, we've compromised a lot of things as Christians. Compromised a lot of things, and somehow the epicenter for this globally is in orthodoxy is is located in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and we see it really exploding there. Um, we see this explosion that's happening. A very manifest, uh, you know, battle between what is happening, obviously in the West, but we're we're not getting shut down. We don't have some pseudo false Orthodox Church trying to take over. It's very dramatic, you know, the manifestation that's happening in in Ukraine, for instance, right now. Um, it's interesting, Father, because getting into as many layers as we can of that manifestation. Um, I think there's a couple of things I definitely want to, you know, kind of touch base on. Yeah. One of them is that um, definitely for us in our community here, um, you know, there were certain things that were very telling. You know, I always have this thing like the demons have a tell. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always a tell to, to see where there's influence. Um, you see it on a kind of personal level. If you're dealing with someone who, who has some demonic or diabolic influence, it's like, you're talking with them and there's always some tell where it's just like, oh, there's the influence of the evil one. Mm -hmm. um, it is, where it's just not a psychological reality that you're dealing with, right? So there's always a tell, even that scales up, I find. It scales up in regards of cultures. Um, and so in regards of like that first real tell that something was off in regards of the narrative, like a false narrative here going one side, you know, um, it was this idea 
that the conflict just kind of like originated recently. Mm -hmm. uh, but the yeah. problem here was many of us in, in this community um, knew that it had been a, a much longer conflict yes. in, in, in a much more explicit way. Um, and so I, I found that that was one of the first tells that something was afoot, something was something was off. Um, because even in regards of, you know, uh, what, 14, 2014 it was, right? Yes. Um, and many of us were kind of looking back um, retroactively at, you know, some of those first murmurs of, you know, the neo-Nazis in Ukraine and all this. But there was also these shiny examples of true faith. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, there's this, I mean, the, that iconic picture of those those um, monastic fathers standing, you know, in the gap between mm -hmm. the state and the protesters. Um, and I, I find that this light of Christ still manifests, you know, even though the demons are showing their hand over and over again oh, yes. to, to really foment frustration and confusion and even hatred for in, in the hearts of people who aren't even there, right? Even the, in the hearts of those here in the States. Yes. There's even still this light of Christ, though. I'm thinking about, forgive me, um, it's, uh, was it Metropolitan Pavel the other day who was arrested? Is it Pavel? Mm -hmm. was, and yeah, the abbot. The yeah. abbot. Yeah. And when he says, I thirst to suffer for Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, a cr what, what a true and pure icon of Christ. Yes. What an, what an amazing example of of the, of what we should all be aspiring to mm -hmm. so there so we see all of course the devil is is always at work but man christ is at work yeah, yeah. really revealing some powerful things to us um could you could you speak a little bit about in regards of that that human reality of what people are are working through in regards of their faith and you know kind of being either crushed or maybe even that goes both ways, right? It's like you can be crushed to a point of despair, but you can also be crushed and be, be, um, be, be the broken bread, if you will, mm -hmm. and the crushed wine and being poured out. You know, I imagine there's just as many people, but they're not getting the airplay uh, that are being encouraged in, in, in the light of, of what's going on. Do you have any kind of... Can I ask a question first? What is a larva? Like, Lavra. I don't know what that is. Lavra. Lavra. Thank you. Sure, yeah, sure. obviously, I don't know what it is. It, it's, it, it's usually, there's a few, there's a, there's only a couple in Russia. Um, it's a, it's a very large monastery. So you have St. Sergius uh, is a Lavra in, in Russia. Okay. And Ukraine has three, as far as I know of, Lavras. Pachayev Lavra, Kiev Kiev Lavra, and Svetogorsk Lavra. Um, so it's usually a monastery that grew very, is very large and has had a, lo a lot of influence in that area for the spiritual development of the territory, the place, it's, the country that it, it is in. It's one of those words I hear all the time, but I just don't know what it means. Sure. And like, I see it in lives of saints and stuff like that. So yeah. I thought, and then last question. And then was, are those, um, are those in Ukraine because they were pre previously like, russian lavras um like and then they were like taken at some point by like you know i don't i don't necessarily even know about the establishment of the ukrainian state so like were they taken at a certain point and at one i mean under ussr they were under like communist control but like before that was that a side of like russian orthodoxy later taken by ukraine yeah the i mean i would say the those lavras, like Pachayev Lavra, was always a, a bulwark of orthodoxy against Uniatism, um, because Uniatism was born in what is now modern day Western Ukraine, territories of Poland and Belarus. Of course, the Union of Brest was signed in Brest, Belarus. Okay. Uh, and that was the union where, where the Orthodox, certain Orthodox in that area and those territories. Um, apostatized um, and went under the Roman papacy and formed what we know as the Uniats, which is our players and everything that's happening over there in the Ukraine. Father, forgive me. Forgive yes. me. I want to pause real quick. 
Um, Cause there is going to be a lot of people who are just not briefed on the history. Okay. Yeah. So, sure. so why don't you. Myself don't you, included. Myself yeah, so included. Why don't you go ahead and lay out a good history as, as much as you feel necessary to set us up really good for a lot of the kind of nuance and the depth that we need to get to. Okay. Well, I think at the union, it's, the union is very important because it's still what's affecting what's the events that we're seeing today in Ukraine. So um, that that union, I wrote, I wrote in our two articles fairly recent. Um, they're on my blog. Um, we'll post and, those up in the notes. Sure. Mm -hmm. And those, um, I think one was I called Rome, Constantinople, or Paul Kiev, and the Union of Man, something like that. I can't, I'd have to go look. Um, <clears throat> but essentially, the in the, these areas that were taken, they were they were Orthodox areas. They were taken by, <clears throat> of course, Roman Catholic empires or kingdoms, um, Polish, and the Orthodox were heavily persecuted in those areas. Um, but they were given. I mean, this is very simplistic, but just to clip along, they were given an option. Well, listen, if you come under, and it was the Jesuits who developed this idea allow them to keep their rights, their external rights of orthodoxy, you know, their Eastern right, all of this thing, even the married priesthood. But all you have to do is accept uh, the Roman papacy, uh, acknowledge the supremacy of the Pope and, and most of the, you know, the doctrine. Um, of so the Father, world. forgive me, just very to connect some dots. This phenomena has also happened in the Near East with um, yes. the Melkites. Mm -hmm. so um, and it's happened in other areas. So this is not unique to the no. Uniats, just so sure. everyone understands. Yes, that's a good point. So it is, it's this, I mean, because ultimately- it's a playbook. It is a playbook, because ultimately Rome is is interested in, in just acknowledging, you have to acknowledge the, the supremacy of, of Rome, and that's what they're after. I mean, simplistically speaking. Pinch of incense. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. So this has this establishment of the union has always been, as you were, you you could say a thorn um, in in this you know orthodoxy in this area. Um, now to to speed up the modern situation, of course, as you asked about the Lavras, um, Andrew, the Pachayev was the rock, right? Saint Job of Pachayev is a very eminent saint from this area, and he upheld orthodoxy when there was a lot of apostasy into unionism because life would just be easier for you right you wouldn't be persecuted you wouldn't you'd get all the privileges of whatever said you know kingdom you were part of um and saint job really stood firm so pachayev it's a, ma um, a major lover there in, in ukraine more in the western area of it um that became the rock of orthodoxy in that area you could say um, through through the help of Christ, of course. Um, so that's one of the important um, monasteries, really very important. Um, now, Ukraine, of course, as we know it, the geographical area of Ukraine is, is indisputably the territorially set by the Soviet Republic. It's a Soviet Republic. Um, and it, after you know, the center part of modern day Ukraine, Definitely. And it's not because I, I'm there. I love the culture. It has a, its own unique culture. It has its, it does have its own unique linguistic expressions. Um, these things are indisputable. Um, but the court, current board, borders that we know as the borders of Ukraine were established by the Soviet Union. I mean, that's just the way it is. And the Soviets took what was the center part we could say of, of Ukraine, or what used to be called Mala Russia, or Little Russia, or Little Rus, probably. And it connected what is Western Ukraine and what is Eastern Ukraine and Crimea all to this and created the Soviet Republic of Ukraine, um, hoping to, as it were, the Soviets, and we see it now, mesh populations and mesh different mindsets. Um, you know, that's that's a goal. Uh, so there, after, the empire, the Russian empire falls um, in this area that was just part of the Russian empire because that's this vast territory. Uh, there, that's when we saw this rise of um, a desire amongst some, not, not the Orthodox, but certain 
that were very motivated by Ukrainian, um, what we would call Ukrainian now, um, desire for, in, you know, kind of more of a national identity. And that's when they first proposed this idea of a Ukrainian national church. Of course, the Orthodox Church um, didn't, didn't follow along with that because we, we, don't, we don't build things upon national lines. It's just, it's kind of sad to see it's happening, but I think ultimately the, the view of the kingdom should be, should be bigger than that. Be bigger forgive than me, Father, I just want to interrupt you real yeah, quick. Yeah, of course, of course. That is one of, that is like, when I was speaking earlier about a tell, right. you know, that's what I mean by a tell, that yeah, you know, sure. the evil one was involved because of the nationalism mm -hmm. that was really beginning to kind of pop up like a like a festering boil you know yes. it's like it's, that's a side of the of the influence of the evil one that's that, seem, that seems to be a stumbling block for a lot of people too they that they start encountering orthodoxy and they start seeing the different like jurisdictions and churches and stuff like that and they seem i i don't know exactly what the argument against it is but it seems to be like, well, how can it be a Russian and a Greek Orthodox church? How can they be the same thing? And then like, not only that, but then to throw in something based just purely off of national identity, mm -hmm. like that would be scandalous. You know, that would to like an outsider who was already having problems with the fact that there are different quote unquote, not my words, but I just had this conversation with someone, denominations of Orthodoxy. It's like, okay, to build something purely based off national identity that is like it's like okay that is you know what's what is the under what's the underlying here what's like going on underneath the surface here so that's it well it's a real i mean I, ultimately i think that the church does come in there is a point to it where it comes into to culture and it beautifies culture and you got and we know that the national whatever the cultural the nations of the world are are all created by god and there's a certain beauty but when that is said above the gospel that's when it gets in we'll say inverted there's a problem right when when me being it becomes idolatrous it, it does exactly and so when me being whatever it would be russian or ukrainian or whatever it is before christ that's where the problem starts and when we start to elevate it you know our nation somehow to almost the level of the church there's there's a problem um and i've you know it's just a an open concern of mine you know i'll see you know because i love i mean i'm really nurtured by the the russian side of things um I, you know it's just when i read i i gravitate towards you know theophon the recluse ignati grand Chininov, um probably because i speak russian i learned russian my wife is slavic um so maybe that's that's part of it but when I see things, for instance, um, you know, right now, like Russia is, you know, going to kind of the savior status when we're giving that to Russia, something goes off in me and I go, hmm, that's, wait, Christ is the savior, the church is the savior, and only these nations, if they are, do participate in that, it's only because of Christ and his church, it's not because somehow innately there's something you know, because what did we do before Russia or Ukraine or Byzantium or or Greek for that matter? What what did we do before that? We had Christ and His Church, and these these cultures, whatever it was, say Byzantine or Greek, it's only beautiful because it had Christ in the Church. That was it. And then when it strayed from that, when it strayed from that, it tanked, and Constantinople fell to the Turks. Mm -hmm. You know. And in the same thing with, you know, with Russia, you know, Russian empire, I mean, it had a lot of problems. We don't want to over, but when it's really strayed from orthodoxy, God, you know, the Lord allowed it to be turned over to communism. One of the, you know, one of the most brutal regimes um, that has ever been on the planet earth and more martyrs in the 20th century than any other century before that more Christian mm -hmm. martyrs. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's, all that's a factor, I think, going back to where we are and in what is this Russian area, because Russia, Ukraine, Belarusia, they all have that common route to Kievskaya Rus um, when St. Vladimir converted. Um, and they all trace themselves back there inevitably. Um, but there's this, and and we know, and back to a very geopolitical level, we know one of the major playbooks of certain forces 
is to um, pit nations against each other you know, mm. to, and, and to aggravate that. So what happened in Ukraine um, is definitely within, and it's, it is demonic as father. Ultimately, it's not just a geopolitical thing. It's inspired by the devil who, who hates humanity. Um, and he, 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 he revels in this kind of distortion, distorted hatred um, towards, to, uh, towards other people. And right now in Ukraine, for instance, there's a lot of Ukrainians that are rapidly hate Russians now. Um, really, and I saw there was that video that came out recently, Father, of, um, you know, there's a kind of neo-folk band mm. playing in the Lavra. And yeah, the, that's, yeah. I see, you know, a, a kind of, you know, fratricidal song. Uh-huh. You know, it's, I mean. Yeah, boy. it's very Soviet. It's very Soviet what they're doing. And it's, um, but it's not all Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine, that's, and then that's the sad thing. I think they all get, I'll, I'll hear from, for instance, maybe more Russian sources and they paint it like they're a bunch of just neo-Nazi whack jobs. But, the, you know, I've been to Ukraine numerous times and they're beautiful people, you know. Um, the, yes, there's some real problems, but I mean, here I am sitting in America <laughs> and man, we could start a real laundry list here, you know, of, of things right. that are problematic. And uh, so it's, I think there's a real problem when we have to paint people like, you know, we have to paint them as the enemy. The Ukrainians are a bunch of, which they're not, there's a lot of good, it, it's an element there, indisputable, um, but they're not all that way. It's an element that's been encouraged, it's been funded, it's been accentuated purposely, um, cultivated and grown because it has a certain purpose. Um, and of course, there's a geopolitical manifestation to that, but more importantly, there's a spiritual reason and manifestation to that also. Father, what 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 are the things is, that cause, I mean, I don't know, like let's say, let's pick a village or a city or a town in Ukraine. And will you find a family divided between, you know, the uh, Orthodox mm. Church of Ukraine or the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, you know? Will you find families divided on that? And if so, why is it that one one side of one part of the family will fall to one side of the other? Is it because, um, you know, regional? Like, I, I mean, it, oh, father so and so, I've known him, and he just kind of happened to fall here. Like, help us understand a little bit about what the what the kind of on the ground dynamic is for for the people and how they find break down the schism that, for people who don't know, break down some of the influence, but also break down how that plays out for for the people. The real life people that are that are caught up in this terrible reality because i just want to say this real quick um one of the one of the real problems of the temptation from the right mm -hmm. which you know a good portion of our audience could be tempted with you know it's 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 reality but one of the temptations from the right is to obviously number one to dehumanize people that might find themselves on, on you know the, the non-canonical side of the schism sure. but also too to not understand how painful how damaging um schism is yeah. that it isn't just this kind of you know you got the wrong flavor buddy you know but it, there's some real problems with it so could you kind of open up a little bit about that and asking for a friend you know uh which is the canonical church like, what's the name of the canonical sure. church? Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Okay. Ukrainian, under Metropolitan Anufri, that's the canonical. And then the uncanonical church is named? Orthodox Church in Ukraine. Boom. Okay. Just want to make sure. Sure. And that's under a fellow named Epifani. Just some guy. Yeah. You know, just some just guy. Some, yeah. I mean, literally, right? Yeah. yeah no, he is. He is <laughs> just some guy. So, yeah, I, I mean, I'll do my best. I mean, I, I really... I've tracked this because I, I love Ukraine. I, I loved Ukraine because I went to Ukraine as a punk Central Coast California surfer um, who was, uh, you know, a PK kid because my, my dad was a Protestant minister. And I went to Ukraine and I felt like I met real people all of a sudden. And so it's, you know, Ukraine, uh, although I didn't become Orthodox at that moment, I encountered Orthodoxy for the first time there. Um, so that's that's why when I saw these things happening, 
um, you know, the, the equation started equaling out. And you can say, I, I started writing about the ecclesiastical happenings in Ukraine, I think in 2018, maybe 17. I'd, I'd have to go back and check my earliest article on that subject. Uh, and that's why, because I just have a, a natural interest in it. Um, and so it, it is painful. Um, and I think what, what happens is this, and you'll see in the videos, I mean, if people watch whatever videos, if you're tracking, mostly, mostly speaking, the, the faithful of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under Metropolitan and New Free, that's the canonical church, you see that they they have a piety, they have a, a certain ethos. They're, you know, they're singing church hymns. They're, you know, they, they know how to, as it were, hold themselves in the house of God, which is, which speaks of something. And you'll see videos when temples are taken by the, I'll just say the OCU, that's the Orthodox, the supposedly Orthodox Church in Ukraine, the non-canonical group. Um, and they don't. Most of them are, you know, they, they really are quite clueless as to what, what it means to be Orthodox. Um, because for them, are, um, and maybe not down to every person, you know, I can't know that. I can't know that necessarily. But it, generally speaking, it, it is a national church. It's a state-formulated church. You could, I think, a good if someone's familiar with Soviet history, a good comparison is the living church mm -hmm. that was established by the Soviets. Um, Sergianism, is that what you guys? Before, before Sergianism. Okay, all right, so before what's the living church, if you don't mind, just real quick. Sure, um, in kind of cliff notes and jump in Father Turbo, sure. if you have, sure. um, please. It, in short, it was, a tendency already in the the church in Imper imperial Russia um, towards what we would call, you know, we'll just call them, for lack of a better word, progressive ideas, you know, not traditional. Okay. I mean, really non-Orthodox and Orthodox, right? I mean, it's, sure. it's hard to say, but they, let's have a married bishopric, let's, um, let's do all these things. We need to update the faith to answer the time. A real right. soft and in increasing secularization. Yes. Mm. Of the church, ultimately. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm and with of, you. of course, when the church, you know, she, she didn't accept that, but when the Soviets came to power, they saw, well, if we, if we play this group, the living church, they called themselves, and we encourage it, we can cause a split in orthodoxy because that's what we want. We want to weaken it. We want to make it split. We want to cause confusion for the people, um, especially people that aren't very familiar with their faith. Um, so what better way to do that than to encourage another form of orthodoxy? So that we see this as, we could call it one of the, the signs, the call signs, right, Father? Yeah, um, the tell. The tell. Um, and, and that's the devil likes to. And we're warned about this by in the saints that he likes what is the antichrist but someone trying to mimic christ i mean ultimately and what are antichrists they're all little pre presumably in their own mind saviors you know every one of them they're going to save us from something right um whatever that might be and so the the same thing with the church there's the, there's going to be this um, false or anti-church, right? And what better way to fight the, the truth of the church of, of Christ's body than with an anti-church? And so that was the living church, and the Soviets loved that. So they they really encouraged the living church. Um, they started taking temples from the Orthodox Church at that time, giving them over to the living church. They jailed all you know Orthodox hierarchs and they gave free reign to living living church hierarchs. Um, very similar pattern that we're seeing in Ukraine for very similar reasons. Of course, there are nuanced differences, uh, but I think it really, it really is a parallel um, for for what's happening. It's um, a pretty close one to one. Like it's a pretty close. Like yeah, this is a good comparison of what's. It's a good comparison, now. and yeah. and the, for similar reasons, why the mm -hmm. state, the states, uh, you know, a state that wants to be God. Mm -hmm. and that's what our secular states want to be. They want to be God to us. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no God but the state. Mm -hmm. And and if you want to be God, then you have to 
just like Caesar did. Why, why, they, why did they not like the early Christian martyrs? Um, even though that you could argue that maybe even pagan Rome was more tolerant than the emerging God state that we have, um, but that would be a slightly different story. Uh, <laughs> But nonetheless, what it was is you just have to you have to acknowledge the divinity of Caesar by pinching incense on his altar. Right? Yeah, yeah. Christians said, "I can't do that. I have one God. I can't. I can't serve. You know, whatever. We'll we'll try to be good citizens. We'll do all these things, but I can't pinch incense on that altar." And the God state wants a similar thing. So, what do you have to do to if if you have another? competing god so to speak well you have to crush it you have to crush it or you have to co-opt it mm -hmm. one of the two and the soviets practice both um we see the modern god states um of which communism was just beta versions um doing similar things and that's what's happened what is what is the competition well it's a church that's going to claim divine revelation that's going to train claim authority over the hearts and minds of men but if the government wants to rule the hearts and minds of men, then you can't have that kind of structure competing with you. So it mm -hmm. has to be either destroyed or co-opted. Right? And, and, and we see also, too, I think this is where we get into, you know, it's really important to keep that um, finger on the pulse of wrestling not against flesh and blood. Yes, yes. Because you see that one of the ways there's the crushing there's the co-opting but there's another tactic mm -hmm. which um i'm sure it's there somewhere in history but it feels like it's fresh and new and it feels like it's a synthesis out of the co-opting and the crushing which is the marginalizing of the otherworldly aspect of the true faith yeah making so, it very materialist the materialist mm -hmm. and yeah. it's, it's the fruit of the nihilistic um you know, kind of uh, self-deifying nature of the secular world um, and the political movements that really kind of usher this in through violence, NATO, you know, all the, you know, all the other also communistic movements. But the way it plays out socially is we saw this with the undermining, again, of the under, other world, the aspect of the, of the church, sacraments, you know, the kind of the Protestantization, the, this kind of Protestant flavor that's trying to be injected into uh, the church, you know, looking at the sacraments as, you know, as a Protestant with a very external, um, very symbolic, kind of just, like, sim you know, symbolic in the wrong way, in the wrong way, yeah. um, you know, and, and pulling out the divine efficacy, the, the power, the connection, the, the, the energies of God being present mm -hmm. in the life of the church. In the light and in, in the way that we encounter the icon in the way we encounter the, incarnationally the reality of our faith all this is playing right now to undermine us in the west but i, I think that softens us up for a crushing and a co-opting right. because when you have unfortunately god help us so many people who have been you know um i would say primed and ready tenderized that when 2020 hit and when the direct attack on the Holy Eucharist, the direct attack on the sacramental life of the church, the otherworldly aspect of the church, it, we, everyone was primed. Mm -hmm. They were ready to feel, no, 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 no. That's, that's backwards. That's old. That's the village orthodoxy. That's old. Like we don't want anything to do that. We they're, they're ready for a living church, if you will hear mm -hmm. in that sense. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I would say, and, and again, Father, please speak to this. I would say it, something probably very similar has happened um, in Ukraine to some degree to some of the people there yes. in regards of, you know, um, fomenting division, devil means, you know, diablos means to divide. So mm -hmm. fomenting division, um, looking to, you know, very much, I mean, the, these things just to show how we're all the same in, 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 in some of the more fundamental ways. It's no different than the way that the devil will foment envy, resentment in African-Americans or other groups to play up a sense of I'm victimized, I'm oppressed, mm -hmm. and, and really to get the ire of against right. what was perceived as your oppressor. And then in turning your ire and anger against them, 
you don't realize that the game of the devil is to do that. Not only so that you can potentially destroy them, but you'll be consumed by your yeah. own hatred, by your own resentment of your of your situation. Is that is is that yeah. make it, is that about right, Father? I mean, do you have you seen that in regards of some of the the kind of you know if we could say the 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 scaled up logis me that's been um assaulting the you know the, the ukrainian people is that is there something to that i think so from what i i mean from what i see there's an immense struggle i think in a lot of places on that level but especially in the ukraine and it's 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 tragic i mean it's very tragic anywhere that it manifests itself mm -hmm. um I mean, I think in the church, you know, in the true Ukrainian Orthodox Church, they're really, you know, what I hear from the bishops that I, you know, I can listen to, Metropolitan and Ukraine, Metropolitan Pavel, Metropolitan Arseny, Metropolitan Luke, uh, Metropolitan Longin, um, you know, they're calling people to Christ, they're calling people above, they're calling people um, to follow after the gospel, um, to not hate, to love, to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to fulfill that. So I think they're they're really rising. So when I, you know, I'm, maybe there's something else, but what I can hear from America, you know, um, sitting, you know, listening to recordings or reading maybe what they've, they've uh, written. Um, so I think that's, that speaks very well uh, for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Um, and, you know, and the, you know, they're really trying to resist that, um, that hatred and that division that the devil sows and it's difficult and we see how difficult that is um have, have maybe they done it perfectly i i don't know but i think they're trying and i think in this world a lot of times that's what that's what counts um so it's it's everywhere I and mean, it's a battle it's just there's this it's intense it seems like all over <laughs> i our usual um uh other member of this podcast cyprian has done another talk on ai not too long ago yeah. on artificial intelligence and he had talked about someone referenced this to me i have i don't really have i don't really listen to a lot of podcasts right now so i haven't had a chance to listen to it but a brother and i uh from the church were talking and he said something along the lines to speak to the material aspect of what we're talking about right now he said um cyprian had stated at some point that if a giant lizard a flying lizard with giant wings came down and landed and breathed fire and you know said look that's a dragon they'd say that's not a dragon because dragons don't exist like you know like kind of just to like say like if it walks like a duck talks like a duck if we're seeing demonic division but we're all chalking it up to like national fervor psychology or emotional or believing some kind of narrative right there about what how things are then like in ignoring completely the spiritual aspect of it, like father talked about a couple of weeks ago in this podcast about looking at history strictly through materialist perspective does not make sense. And it's actually pretty yeah. not fruitful. It's actually pretty harmful because you're looking at things devoid of the spiritual aspect, the spiritual side of things. So if you look and you say, look, can you not see how the devil is working in this situation turning brother against brother mm -hmm. you know church against church or church against church you know person against person well that's not the devil because the devil doesn't exist or you know that's the devil may exist but the russian orthodox church is worse you know or something like that like or the devil is working through a certain side rather than they're not seeing that the whole kit and caboodle is all one giant trap they're saying you know like oh well ukraine's the devil or oh russia's the devil in this situation so well it's interesting to me because i think um the scaling up and the scaling down you know looking at it um like pastorally with a with a person right an individual it's like one of the things always looking to heal is the division between someone's head and their heart mm -hmm. and that's where a lot of mental illness comes from that's a lot of where a lot of interpersonal issues, addictions, it's, there's direct result where there's this broken dichotomy, right? And then our tradition is all about the integration of the whole person, you know, in the light of Christ, right? Christ being the archetype. And when we follow and, and, and seek to map ourselves and to be, um, to be integrated and put together in the light of Christ, we're healthy, right? We function as we're intended to, but the demons, 
through Gizmi, through thoughts, through temptations of the flesh, all these things foment uh, division between the head and the heart, right. right? And so we see this is fundamentally the issue, kind of almost consistently, right? Different flavors of it, different flavor, but ultimately that division, um, which is, you know, from the time of the fall, the problem. Well, it, it seems as if this has also come a playbook scaled up, right? Because Kiev, um, and, you know, getting back to the baptism of Rus being like, it's the heart of mm. that, of that, of that um, God-given expression of orthodoxy, right? Um, the, that division between the heart, Kiev, and the, and the head, if you will, in, in the way that the, Ru the Russian expression has kind of developed, right? And, you know, you see this uh, in other areas too, it's like I'm waiting for you know. There's been the long-standing issue with Kosovo and Serbia, mm -hmm. and Kosovo is the heart, right? Yes, Kosovo true. is the heart, and so you see you see the powers that be. Uh, of course, there's the the external manifestation, the the the, the Western civic powers, but fundamentally the demonic powers yes. are trying to now foment and and I, I imagine we'll see something probably similar, but in a different way, taking another step with Kosovo, you know. But this this movement to divide a, a people, the head from the heart. Yes, yes. It's the same playbook in regards to the individual. Yeah. Divide the head and the heart, get 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 a, a almost schizophrenic confusion mm -hmm. to go to go within a body. And once that body's compromised, then it's it's ripe to be co-opted, possessed, if you will, um, and to be used contrary and that's always the thing christ doesn't use people christ seeks to liberate people right. and peoples right and the enemy always seeks to use mm -hmm. um the, the powers that be politically and again which are the external manifestation of the spiritual reality they don't care about the people of ukraine no they, they want to use the people of ukraine as fodder as battering rams mm -hmm. um as hostages yes. for for a greater political narrative and it's really tragic because when people fall into a very um, crude and simplistic black hat, white hat dichotomy, we don't engage the, we don't engage the grace that we should in regards of our prayer. Mm. Because we, we could find ourselves, you know, praying for one side versus the other and, and almost as if that's going to make a difference when really the difference needs to be made for Christ to be manifested in the situation, yes, you know, yeah. and, and it, it's tough because when people start to hear this, I, I find this a lot, but it's tough. Um, when you start to speak about this, not just in regards of Ukraine and Russia, but left, right, you know, it, it oh, so you're, you're defending, you're defending the heretics. Oh, so you're defending the woke. So you're defending the transgenders. And it's like, I mean, no, right? It's like not defending schism at all. You know, it's terrible. But there's a reality that the trap is very much to turn yourself into um, a zealot, to turn yes. yourself into Barabbas, to turn yourself yes. into someone who's touting ideology versus the otherworldly redemptive power of the suffering Christ, the one who draws all in together as he's lifted up suffering, you know? And people feel that's too poetic. You know, they think that's nice father, but when it comes down to it, I'm gonna make Swiss cheese with some people if I have to. And it's like, this, this is the trap I think, you know? And, it, and it's, it becomes very easy to, um, you know, kind of see yourself as, as, as Rambo on the other side of it. There's but a very self-righteous like aspect to it. Of it's like tough. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm a Missourian. Like, I'm very much like <laughs> I want to pick the side that's the no nonsense. Like, this is the way things should be. Like, this is we're gonna return back to the way things should be. You know, and that's a trap in and of itself. It's like, well, find me a time where things were as they should be. Yeah. It's like, well, that was a long, long time ago, and we're trying to get there. Like right now. Like we're trying devoid of anything that's going on in the world. We're trying to get back to there. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, it's funny because I think people don't realize that doesn't work out. It, it goes wrong both ways. I'll give you an example. Um, it's tough, whatever. And 
forget us, Father. We get we get into hot water, but you know we're kind of reckless here. But um, you know, talk about like the EP and <laughs> this this desire, you know, um, the fanar and this desire to kind of like stay in some obviously distorted, twisted past. Constantinople fell. Oh yes, you know what I mean, and it, it God go. allowed it to fall for a reason. And look at how much wickedness, how much confusion has been sustained, fomented, and and really disseminated into the world by this wanting things to be the way they were. Mm-hmm. You know, if nothing else, it's like I know people want to spin a nuance on it, but like I don't really see like, what is the fruit of it. What is the fruit of trying to preserve something that God doesn't want preserved? Right, and, and I think that EP is a snapshot, an inverted icon of what that looks like. You know, yeah. So I what what gave it just real quick that it was its spiritual life, you know, that gave it that its original elevation. Saint John Chrysostom, I mean, Photius, they had uh-huh. so many. And okay, if we want the prestige of whatever it is, we you know, now it's not Constantinople, obviously, but then live that live that life live the life of christ you know show show let's let's have this yeah hierarchs leading the way or clergy or anyone Mm -hmm. but when when it's just holding on to power for power's sake Mm -hmm. prestige for the sake of prestige holding on to the first seat when when really the you know the spiritual authority to do so is no longer manifesting itself um, then something is is wrong. We just read in the gospel about the disciples, right? This past Sunday about, you know, don't be like the Gentiles mm-hmm. who are mm-hmm. lording it over each other because mm-hmm. they think that's where power is. Mm-hmm. No, our power is in Christ alone and in his truth. And in as much as we are giving ourselves to that, that's when the church lives. And that's when, you know, all of those great men suffered, you know, St. John Chrysostom, we remember them, but he walking barefoot into exile, you know, as the bottom of his feet were bleeding off, you know, dying in exile, so much of that, that's, that's the glory of the church. I would say in Ukraine, to some extent, and in Kosovo, as you mentioned, it, that's, that's the glory of the church. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you for my name's sake. Right, because then that means something is right there because the world hates it, mm-hmm. you know. But when the world is stroking our ego, we know something's wrong. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> another, right. another, another tell possibly. That's you right. Know, when we're when we're being we're receiving the approbation of the world. Oh man, the, the red light should be going off in our head. What is wrong that the world is? You know, in the ju- in the sense that John, you know, and others uh, use that in, in the sense right. of the fallen system. You know, right. you know, obviously right. not not creation and all of the, the those beautiful things that are from God, but the fallen system of the world. When that right. fallen system, because you can't be and it was his, whoever is a friend of the world is an enmity with God. As Saint right. James tell us that. That's right. Um, it, it's interesting too, Father, because one of the things that I see again, and, and it's tough because. These are issues that, again, you know, mentioned uh, this is a running theme of scaling up and scaling down, right? And so that line in which, when am I, when am I engaging the gospel in regards of laying my life down to win it, you know, versus the temptation to, I'm going to preserve my life at all costs, but, I, but ultimately lose it, right? right. And, and, and I see what I see, again, Mostly, and I loved your observation about the people of the canonical church, they know how to handle themselves in the house of God. They know how to handle themselves as the people of God, mm-hmm. whereas the other side, and I, and I know I'm falling into a little bit of that, but for the sake of some coherence, we have to see that there is yeah. some, some, some lines of delineation. Uh, they don't know how to handle themselves as the people of God. And so interestingly enough, though, beyond just the singing of hymns, and something that someone could point to as just a kind of external piety, you, I'm seeing typically a sacrificial mm-hmm. spirit coming out mm-hmm. of the people under, you know, his holiness of Nufri, you know, like yeah. it's very different, right? And, and that willingness to um, lay the life down, because I think they know, and this, this is what I'm trying to get at, 
They know what's at stake is Christ, not just their buildings, right. not just their livelihood or, you know, the comfort of what they've experienced. Whereas the other side, they're fighting for power, mm -hmm. um, you know, my rights as, as, a, as yes. an ethnicity, as a yes. nation, right? And you can feel that very strongly with everything that, that's being communicated. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's one of the reasons why it's so easy for now. Um, it's so easy to really kind of like make those hard lines. But the reason why I said for now is it seems to me that it's just a little too simple. And that's one of the things maybe you could speak about. I really wanted to ask you this tonight at some point. And this is all just, you know, at the end of the day, this is a podcast, you know, right. and uh, we're not solving the world's issues, right? Yeah, no, but it seems as if there's a larger thing at play. I want to get back to a little bit of the unit aspect. I want to get a little bit back to... Um, the way that um, influence in a kind of more um, in, in the sense of ecumenism, this could really yeah. usher in yeah, yes. a movement of ecumenism that I, that, that, you know, I really wanted you to touch on this father that I think a lot of people aren't expecting. I think that there's a movement to ecumenism that is a little bit more subtle than I think people are realizing in regards of, of, of influence do you, does that yeah. is, do you think there's something to that can we define ecumenism real quick just for in case this is someone's first episode you know Probably when you, hopefully sure. when you guys could sure so um i'll say ecumenism as opposed to ecumenical right yeah. ecumenical being a willingness to see where someone who may differ from my tradition uh is on a path towards experiencing or searching for god so I'll, I'll engage to some degree in an ecumenical sense in regards of like, you're a human being. I know Christ has come and he, the, you know, the, the spirit was poured out upon all flesh and Pentecost and Christ is looking to draw all men unto him. Ecumenism is a pluralistic secularized movement that's based out of the, its, its root is um, perennialism which says that all movements, all traditions, all spiritual perspectives are equal and have the same root. And we would say they don't. There's only one Christ, mm -hmm. one, one church of Christ. And when a man, you know, mankind is drawn unto that one church, one Christ, salvation is found. Salvation is being united in theosis uh, and brought to a therapeutic a relationship in the church and that therapeutic relationship unites you to Christ because now you're healed of your passions and your sins and through the participation of the divine energies which are only found in the life of the church united to God. Mm -hmm. Ecumenism seems seeks to water that down, marginalize it and spread it out in a way that is um, filled with death. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, that's how I would define, is, is that good enough father? Does that work? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. And it's definitely, I mean, ecumenism started it really um, within the, the Protestant Christian realm um, mm -hmm. because of the problem there of, of the contradicting things. Um, and so they, they um, you know, all we, we all have to come together. We all have our little portion of, of the faith. And if we all come together, we'll get the, the full picture again. Um, whereas of course, his father Turbo was very well saying that it's it's there. We we have to live it. It's in the church. Um, so it's a false. It's trying to create a new church. It's an anti-church again. I would say it falls into anti-church. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, yeah. No, but I think you're right, Father. That's I. It's uh, that with ecumenism, this this push towards that. I think it's definitely part of what's happening in the Ukraine. Um, definitely. Oh, that's a yeah it's a big <laughs> do, do you do you think that it, it i mean it seems to me that the one of the ways that it plays out is there's a real setup to have um those who would understand the need to not just have their sympathies but the obligation to um, be in line with the canonical understanding 
that it the setup is for us to be seen as um you know fundamentalist zealots um and exclusive like, exclusive you yeah. know i mean that that's one of the issues that um we we you know it's 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 the slightest paper cut yeah. of of struggle that we have here in the states but everyone's experienced it sure. it was a convert where you have this phenomena where it's like you don't even say something to someone and then they accuse you of being arrogant right. or they accuse yeah. you because it's they the, the quote unquote exclusiveness of everything you know it just it irks mm-hmm. you know the 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 um the kind of tendencies the of of you know americans and, and westerners you know but it seems as if that seed which you know plays on the ego and the pride and it's spiritual it seems as if that seed could bear some real bad fruit going down the line because i'll give you an example you know getting back to the kind of mpc culture uh, comment you know i i mean we see it here in kansas city i see it when i've traveled where you know people have quote unquote ukrainian flag flying from their porch um you know stickers on their car um and i'm like you couldn't even find it on the map for right. real <laughs> yeah for real. You know i mean you couldn't even yeah. find it on the map um yeah. and and yet to give question to anything automatically it's like oh you're one of them you yeah. know and it's just like you just tick you just check the box tick the mark okay so you're a trumper you're a racist you're a homophobe you're all those things and it seems as if there's a setup there because you know, one of the problems with ecumenism is that it's it's seen as the logical conclusion of what's what's fundamentally this kind of perennialist yes. um, one one world religion that's yes. coming, which is all but here. Yeah, yeah which real. is all but mm-hmm. here because yeah. I, for, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, um, and again, not speaking per se against. <laughs> individuals of persons because you know god knows and, and we all can be uh we can all be tempted with blind spots right but the reality is is that there's people there's clergymen who are you know without any real discernment chomping on the bit for you you with rome right oh, yes. you know that that's not, that's not that's not for a boogeyman real. that's not a boogeyman i know no, i personally know people who would welcome it yeah and, and i personally know people who who i mean um you could you know you could go into the hellhole of facebook and if you <laughs> dig long enough you'll find quote unquote clergymen who from the beginning were you know speaking ill of their own hierarchs because uh, they were russian and like how could you know i mean there's that terrible nun who unfortunately uh, is not yeah, there yeah. who she's no nun you know but she's you know talking you know so poorly of russia and all these things and 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 really, it's about this nicer, quieter, um, more politically correct orthodoxy, mm-hmm. um, which doesn't save people. It doesn't call mm-hmm. people to repentance. Mm-hmm. It doesn't call people to the truth. Um, and, and, and so it's the other side of what we're speaking of, I, I think. Um, and that's something I think we need to really look at is this temptation, um, which will feel, I think, on a broader level of the the popular narrative and the and the um, the kind of uh, the zeitgeist, if you will, is mm-hmm. moving towards this. Well, it's we've had enough religious wars. We've had enough Ooh. of these things, you know. I'm sorry. No, I I actually someone something someone. I'm very excited. Someone someone said something to me in a book in the church bookstore a couple months ago or like a couple weeks ago and it really was one of those like i think it's christ because christ always does this thing with me where there's this like the big wall of china and he like walks along he's like right there and he just touches that and like the whole thing crumbles like he finds the exact weak spot to like touch and like a bunch of stuff just comes crumbling down at once or he's like i think we've compared him to like calabat no whatever the guy the inhuman from marvel comics is that can always find the weakness in the thing and exploit it but um we were talking about buddhism and we're talking about like it's like um calming and soothing nature and how it's meant to pacify Mm -hmm. so like this new religion this new ecumenism is is not meant to 
hurt. It's not meant to like call anybody to repent. It's pacify. Meant to pacify. It's just mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, 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 I want to say, because like that, that was really big for me because I was like, if you, if you are promising and it's part of my own repentance as well as I, you know, working in recovery, I've told, I don't know. I don't think hundreds of people, but tens of people techniques to just calm there's no there's no repentance there's nothing but just bring it back to zero bring it back to zero and that's it like that's all i can really offer and if a religion is coming forth or if quote unquote the church is bringing forth like hey you're fine just the way you are like mm -hmm. the inner struggle like that's the that that's you know not today satan you know like you don't worry about that inner struggle like you just worry about loving everyone regardless and it's not your place to judge and it's just meant to soothe and calm it's it's giving the the child the ipad when they're throwing a fit rather than sitting down and engaging with them and finding out why they're upset what's going on and actually seeing some fruit from that conflict it's just giving them the ipad and being like i, I don't want to deal with you right now well it's just love you no know it's that. not and it's interesting to me because i mean it's on so many levels right so the first thing saint sophroni you know he brings this up in regards of this misconception and it's a, and it's a very pernicious one um when people begin to look at our tradition and they look at like let's say the jesus prayers of mantra and they begin to really quickly misunderstand you know the jesus prayer hesychasm is not about bringing you some you know kind of like um vegetative state in yeah. fact the spiritual disposition of a hesychast is one of tension and yes. and, and one of struggle and that mm -hmm. that's one of the big things it's like there are aspects of peace but the peace that you get from the prayer is not peace as the world gives my right. peace i give to you but not as the world gives and so this is one of the things that people this is why you see people bounce you know a year two years into the church is like okay um i came in because history i came in because it's the right. most conservative branch of christianity i came in because there's no homosexuals or wokes i came in because it's not <laughs> But then you come to Christ and Christ's like, okay, now it's time to work. Whoa, 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 whoa. What do you right. mean it's time to work? And you see this on the other side of it too, where people, their homeos, their state of kind of like homeostasis or their resting state is that of anger and resentment. So this is the problem with the, with the temptation from the right. If you're already operating off of, I hate the left, I hate the left, I hate the left. And that's your, that's your kind of resting state. Well, you're at peace there. And Christ <laughs> calls you to kind of come out of that right yeah. and so yeah. no 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 i want to stay angry and christ is like no you need to come out of that state but that that coming out of the state of anger is unsettling for the person who has become acclimated to that passion yeah. right so christ is always looking to you know expose like you said that weakness in which you've built that idol in which you've built that false temple and he wants to like jenga pull out that one block to get it all to crumble so that, you yeah. know, this is St. Theophan the Recluse, you know, when he's speaking to the nuns in the Divine Spark, that collection, he talks about, mm -hmm. I can't remember which nun it was, but he says about building the inner temple. This is what yeah. our spiritual life is, is building an inner temple, building um, a, a place in which Christ can be worshiped inwardly. And that work is one of tension. That mm -hmm. work is one of struggle. And everything that's moving, whether it's the ideologies, left or right, it's seeking to bring you to a false sense of homeostasis and to lull you. So mm -hmm. if you're lulled by your anger and your outrage, no problem. The mm -hmm. devil will give you anger and outrage. 100%. If you're lulled to sleep by being nice and not wanting to offend, no problem. Because as long as you are basically not on that tension, right, he's got you, left or right, whatever, it doesn't really matter to him. If you're annoying people because they want to make blanket statements, you're like, ah, it's not quite that easy. Mm -hmm. Then you're kind of maybe in the right spot. <laughs> it's just like, like, oh, so God's love. Sure. But what sure. is love? <laughs> but what is love? What I mean, is what, love? Is that, what does that look like? I mean, what does that look like on a day to day? You know, right. and how come the same Christ who's supposedly so loving you know, like, how can he be like calling people brood of vipers and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Like, that doesn't sound loving. And it's one of my favorite quotes is um, from Father Stephen DeYoung on his Councils of Wisdom. I think it's he goes verse by verse through the Bible. It's an excellent podcast. And he talks about like, this is part where Christ is reprimanding the Pharisees, I think. 
And he says, oh, listen to how unchristlike Christ is being right now. And I was just like, oh, beautiful, yeah. beautiful. That's right. That's right. Oh, um, but uh, so I, I kind of wanted to ask. Um, so if if there's this, if, if we can call it like a um, proxy war happening between the East and the West, and it happens to be settling here in the it, it, or settling there in the Ukraine. Um, do you guys have any idea, like long term, what this looks like in a year, six months? You know, it doesn't have you know nothing's written in stone. We can all be wrong. I'm wrong a lot, but you know, I mean, do you? I, how do you guys see this going down? Um, broad strokes. I mean, obviously, big broad strokes is AC. I mean, big big broad strokes is ecumenism, is the acceptance of watering down the faith for the sake of pleasing the world. You know, and then AC. You know, so but like. Any other like thoughts or quote unquote predictions, like how we could see things possibly going with the caveat that none of us claim to be clairvoyant at all. So what do you got, Father? I you know, I think the there's a I feel like there's two two paths, you know, seemingly two paths. It's, it kind of ties in to what your your podcast is focused on in the world right now, and you know the one the one is this whatever you know everyone's yelling democracy and skittles and you know all of this <laughs> stuff here, and you know the other is this this more conservative version you know personified or you know typified or whatever exemplified by the emerging you know this i was just reading i mean this is kind of the geo you know but it's all tied we understand everyone understands there's there's this greater thing spiritual dynamic but we see the goals really are go are going to be the same and we just saw the BRICS nations are are talking about issuing a global currency, you know, to supplant the dollar. That global currency, they want to eventually digitize, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same thing. And and then, lo and behold, our own, you know, beloved uh, central bank, you know, in America, the mm -hmm. Federal Reserve is talking about, oh, there, you know, guess what? We're going to do a digital federal currency, you know. Uh, China's already, you know, so we, we see all these, they're all doing the same thing. And Ukraine, I, I feel like Ukraine to some deg degree, I mean, it's a real, it's a tragedy because people are dying, you know, people are losing husbands, people are losing sons. Um, Christianity is being persecuted, absolutely, 100%. And on the long term, though, it, it almost seems like it's, it's you know, I, I, I don't know, from, from, I'll just say it this way. I don't want A or B that's being offered. I don't want the BRICS supposedly more conservative global dominance or the European, Anglo-Saxon, whatever we're going to call it, European, you know, dominance that has been in control right now. But in the long run, it's it's still exactly that. Um, and I think that that plays into where we have to be very cautious. And I think we're in times where one of the big traps I see. Or I, that my impression is, as we want, and this is what primes us possibly for little ACs or big AC, we want an earthly savior. Uh -huh. We want an earthly savior. We want some government to fix it, or we want some country to be better than our own country, you know, because we're full of Skittles and all kinds of other problems, which inevitably we are. But I think there's a real problem looking right now to earthly saviors so there's going to be some kind of i really what i feel is that there's our own our hope is going is in the heavens we really have to remember that our our answer and savior is a heavenly king orthodox empires are gone they're gone i don't i don't i don't really i mean just speaking for my, myself i don't um, from saint john maximovich um, he said we entered into the last apocalyptic, I, I believe he were, I, I could go double check, but I'm pretty sure he uses the word apocalyptic age um, with the death of the Tsar, Nicholas. Um, I think I used that quote, I had an article on Tsar Nicholas, but uh, anyway, 
And I think that's important. We, we did the world, the 20th century, Saint, Father Saint Seraphim of Platina, uh -huh. his, that's who yes. he is. Yes. Talks about this. I mean, his survival course, he documents all of this. The 20th century, man, talk about, I mean, there was lead up, but something clicked in the 20th century. Um, and we're in, we're in abnormal times. And we I think we really have to, uh, not to glorify anything in the past, but we're really something clicked and we're just in ab, it's strange times, very strange, stranger than anything before. And, and, and St. Seraphim speaks about this. Um, so I think there's that one of the big things is looking that there's going to somehow, I feel like whatever way it goes, the same ultimate step is taken. That's my impression. Now, how that's going to pan out, um, I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I can't, can't really say, but that's, that's, um, that's kind of what I would offer. I don't know, whatever that's. Yeah, I, I just, if I could tag team to use a wrestling of course, please. Uh, you know, just to kind of <laughs> jump into the ring with you. Uh, it, it seems to me that some of the core problems we're really facing is a refusal of the people of God to see exactly what you just said, Father, what St. Seraphim Rose outlined, what St. John Maximovich was his spiritual father outlined, and even getting back to this lineage and this patristic lineage, um, St. John of Kronstadt, you know, St. the Van Clues. I mean, they all warned of what was coming mm -hmm. yes. and the chastisement that came to Russia. Yes. And that that movement is is how God has always operated. Mm. And that's a tell. That's a tell of how God works now. Mm -hmm. And that temptation to want to make an idol of the past. Israel mm -hmm. was Israel was guilty of it. And in many ways, orthodoxy and the people of the church, Orthodox Christians could be tempted to become like Israel of old mm -hmm. or yeah. Israel, Israel at the time of Christ, right? In the sense that wanting to look wrongly at the past and to hold something autonomously when the Messiah was there amongst them right. and they mm -hmm. missed him, right? Mm -hmm. And we are, and th this is the thing, it's so hard because my, my work now is, and it has been, is to really for my flock and any anyone who can hear my voice to be like please you have to understand what is coming for you is not what you think it is right you're, you like whatever side you're whatever side you find yourself on whatever your predilection is i'm telling you you need to see it for what it is because that's where you're going to get hit it, it's 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 not in saying no to something. It's, it's, it's not in rejecting something that's obvious that you don't like. It's going to come in taking the thing that is going to tempt you. Mm. That's the real problem. And so the desire to want to have an Orthodox king, not going to happen. Mm. Orthodox empire, not going to happen. Um, Christian empire, never, never was and never will be, right? Like we, you know, I understand I understand, honestly, where like good people are coming from. Let's get back to our Christian roots as America. But like, when I say this, people shut off because they think, well, I always knew there was a little bit of liberal in your father. I always knew you're woke. But like, look, the like the Christianity that you think this nation was built upon was deism and moralism. Bricklayers. Bricklayers. Like yeah. that's that's undeniable, yeah. right? And as long as you want to hold on to something that wasn't what you think it was, you're being tempted in the past, right? You're making an idol of a past that wasn't real. You will miss Christ among you now. You will miss mm -hmm. how Christ is trying to bring you. That's how you experience Christ is in the now. You experience God in the now. You have mm -hmm. to be present with God. The practice of our prayers, our asceticism, the life of the church, it, that's why you can't have liturgy and you can't engage the sacraments through digital media because it's incarnational right. and any yes. longing for the past is not incarnational right right so today is the day of salvation today is the day, day of is salvation day. father co i i might be wrong here but at a certain point didn't god's like presence leave the ark of the covenant like yes well, so 
it would be a little bit like no it's the ark well god left that a long time ago it's like no it's the ark it's the ark of the covenant like you know the actual physical ark itself or the temple temple. you know the temple when they were like no it's the temple we need it's like christ is right here it's like no but the temple the temple that's right and and you know like saint seraphim rose said you know the temptations of the believers the last days will be of a a profoundly psychological nature something to that effect in order to navigate them we have to be living in another world Mm -hmm. right and people that's what 2020 was all about and and i think that's the thing is understanding god's hand we all know where the globalists, the NWO, the right. WF, all the various kind of suits and masks that the enemy wears. But ultimately, it's time for us to really start looking at, okay, we know what the devil is doing. What's God doing? Right. And I think that's where we need to really shift our attention as the people of God and see that, okay, this, this was a chastening, a chastening. Mm-hmm. This is a wake-up call sent by God. This is about us getting back to the gospel message, getting back to the incarnational reality of our faith, getting back to that martyric edge of orthodoxy, yes. getting back to those things that link us to the church historically, mm-hmm. which is martyrdom, which is an otherworldliness, which is a rejecting of the accolades and the and the friendship with the world, right. which is like which is like you said earlier, Father, enmity with Christ. These are the things that what's coming down the pike. I think. The only way to combat them is keeping that that living orthodoxy, not the living church, but the living right. tradition within our hearts, which is born out of repentance. Mm-hmm. Because what's missing from all of these narratives and all the temptations is a call to repentance. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the that's another tell, both in how you can tell where God is moving. Is there a spirit? And the savor of repentance is that salt, Mm -hmm. is the saltiness of repentance, you know, kind of being present, or is it something else that's looking to assuage, you know, security in this earth? Because identity, whatever it is, a national identity, a political identity of of, of a, a, you know, glorious earthly reign, all of that is is temporal. It's all tied to the dead husk of this life. Mm. That's passing away, ultimately. Well, it's like fathers, I mean, back to St. Sarah from Rose, I mean, he, he, I think in him speaking from the deep formation he had from St. John Maximovich and the others that were, you know, new elders, the saints in Russia, but he said the, the new martyrs of Russia that, you know, his book, that's the hand, that survival handbook for those of us in these, in these times. And I think that's kind of a little bit back to Ukraine. That's why we see that what, that What's it going to look like? It's going to look like a church that has no hope in a state, doesn't have a state protector. It's being persecuted by the state. Um, it's being, you know, they're suffering. They have they, their hope literally right now. The only hope they have is in Christ because there's no other, there's no one else coming to help uh, Metropolitan and New Free in the church in Ukraine, literally. Um, oh, wow. And so I think it, in some sense, it, it shows us that, um, you know, what's it going to, well, we're not going to have that. I mean, maybe certain places, but ultimately, how much freedom do we, does this, you know, there's, there's that beautiful, I mean, I think it's in the, um, the New Martyrs of Russia book speaking about, you know, the freedom, the freedom, the true freedom in Christ. I've come to set you free. You know, this is what we're, and that's what, it, and there's a certain, relinquishing that that um, a modern political state demands of the church Mm. um you know and you can see that manifested in various areas because then you have to you have to begin to speak on a certain level um you can't or you could say you your your freedom to speak really to what's happening is is um is lost because you can't defend maybe the state that's patronizing you at the current you know for fear of losing that patronage, um, and and sadly, I've been I'll, I'll speak, and I know I've I've seen it because I've seen the videos, um, you know, of, of cer- certain priests even in Russia, you know, God and God bless Russia. I mean, God bless, truly, not again, but it's kind of exalted as this is going. You know, it's neither that or this because there's priests that have been suspended, suspended because 
they prayed for peace in Ukraine, not for the victory of the special operation. Oh, wow. You know, wow. and so they, they've, they've, there's a freedom that's lost. Well, what, shouldn't we be praying for peace? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't we be praying for that? And, but no, you can't because you have to pray for this, the victory of the special operations. Well, wait a second. That's, so we've, we, you lose, there's a certain freedom in Christ that is, that is lost through a wedding sometimes, or most of the time, I think nowadays, that's of, right. of the state and the church. And that's, that's, um, you know, and the, the church has to be the prophet. It's the prophet to the age. And we have to maintain our prophetic voice. And that's the only thing that's going to save our world. And what's going to draw people to Christ is exactly that, that per ability. And to as weak as we are, as men and broke, you know, but to be able to speak not our own voice, but the prophetic voice of the church to a world that desperately needs to hear it. And when we're shut up because we're trying to appease whatever it is, you know, the White House through pandering to it, through, and there's certain Orthodox groups doing that, you know, in its whole agenda, or the other side of that, you know, which seems a little bit more conservative, but it still has, you know, you, we're still losing the freedom of the prophetic voice. And that prophetic the, voice is always one of salt. Yes, absolutely. it's always salty, and and I, I'm glad you brought that up, Father, because that I think, I think that succinctly puts the thing that I've been trying to say for so long, and what it's it's this loss of the prophetic voice. Yeah, because if we don't have it, who will? Right. Yeah, for right. real. And what's for the real. place of the in the in the book of? I mean, obviously, it's the book of the age. I mean, you, but really, where where's the church? ultimately in this world in the book of revelation it's in the desert why because the desert is where freedom is in christ yeah. um, not not as it were in the empires of this age uh -huh. um, you know as good as some of those pastors but they're gone like you said they're gone they're That's off right. the, the they're off and the the spirits that we're we're facing right now um uh, you know their their goal is not building a heavenly kingdom <laughs> it's just not uh sure. and so so i think again back to ukraine even kosovo you know in these areas that have in some sense um by god's providence i mean really you know blessed are you blessed are you if there's you know and and the, but they're they're in a place where they they don't have a political you know they're losing that political hope and maybe that's 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 exactly what we need maybe well i think it's i think it's a hallmark of the path that we're called to because that's also mm -hmm. our history i mean we just celebrated saint mary of egypt right and she became the bride of christ in the desert absolutely yes. absolutely right? and she found freedom and she rest found freedom in the yeah. desert yeah and she it's found always rest been in, too that's right. i mean like after 17 years she found it eventually so that's right that's um right. i have a sincere question did I miss uh, Seraphim Rose's canonization? Because twice you guys have called him Saint Seraphim Rose, and we all know. I mean, we all know. But what, did I miss something? Was he? Well, he was officially canonized in uh, in Georgia. Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah. Okay, so he we can say, finally start saying. Well, that's Saint all Seraphim. we need. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You could say he's locally canonized in Georgia, but that's all we need. Now, yeah. I mean, that's like really just like the crowd just bursts. I mean, the yeah. door just bursts. I'm like, okay, sure. cool, Saint Seraphim Rose. Like, yeah, yeah that's legit. Absolutely. So um no i'm i'm we all knew it i knew yes, it we absolutely. all knew it so yeah i've been praying to him for a while so mm -hmm. yeah we um, all have yeah he's great he's great um so uh that's that was my question i mean i think ultimately that's that's the problem is is that like if if i think that sums it up perfectly is if we're not if the church is not doing it who is going to because there's not going to be like another organization as certainly like me as an orthodox christian whenever another organization outside the church talks about something i immediately am very suspect of what they're saying i'm immediately like okay what agenda are they pushing whose agenda are they pushing what's going on here and if we're not the people saying like this whole thing over there this is not this is not the real fight this is not the real battle and the fact that you guys are engaging in this fake that is all like going according to plan you know like that's the plan the plan is to do that and, like over here 
this is where the truth is. Like this is this is what you want to be focusing on because this stuff is going to be nothing after a while. You know, like after a while, this will be absolutely nothing. So, um, I actually had a question for you guys, and I, I'm very I'm very happy to be able to talk to two priests because I think it's just it's a very very good thing. Um, so I actually was talking with a brother from the church a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about you know, some of the machinations that happened in 2020 and stuff like that. And like, um, I, I was taking a stance about, um, the nature of the virus and he was taking another stance against the nature of the virus and everything was said. And we parted ways as friends. Cause we're friends, we're buddies. Like he's my brother in Christ. We get along very, very well. And I said something along the lines of, and I guess I just assumed I was like, well, we'll find out in the next world. We'll find out, you know, the machinations in the next world. And it was kind of the consensus with me, with this guy and a couple other guys, like, no, we won't. It's it's not really, we're not going to be worried about it. And like, it was kind of always my impression that like, eventually, not even in this life, but everything's going to come to light. Like, eventually, everything will be brought to the surface. And so we will see like, oh, whether or not it was real or not real, if it was just a virus or a chemical attack, you know, blah, blah, blah. We will all like eventually find out. And I guess I wanted to ask you guys, like, do you think that there will be, I mean, obviously everyone's sins will be revealed. Their, their inner life will be revealed. But as far as like the inner machinations of like, or the machinations of like what was behind the, the, the forces that drove the big policies and like, um, guidelines of 2020 like is that is that something that we're going to get like definitive according to you, what you guys think like definitive like oh yeah this happened and this happened and this happened or are we so just not even going to care about it anymore and you're just like whatever you are you guys following what i'm saying did i do i, I would just say i think there's a both and there i think that where it's pertinent and where it's needed for the truth to be revealed it will and i think there's a lot of uh, distraction that was caught up in it and everything you know it's like if you look back at the Reichstag there's a lot that to the people in Germany at that time are lost to us there's details that like are lost to us but we just understand the Reichstag as a false as a false flag right you know what I mean sure sure so I think that's a, I think that's a I feel a safer way to kind of maybe try and interpret it in the sense of you know, there's going to be details that maybe aren't going to be, that are obviously not going to be pertinent because there's so many. And think sure. about part of, the, part of the way that we're watered down now is, is a, being inundated with what's perceived to be, in, you know, pertinent information and it's not. This is exactly where I was hoping the conversation was going right. to be. So, and yes. So, yeah. And so I think the thing is, is that there's a principle that uh, it's tough to kind of understand it but you come to this place of either experiencing it or, uh, and it's, it's learning to see without looking, you know what I mean? Um, learning to um, hear without listening, you know? And, and I think that in order to do that, basically what that means is, you know, when you, um, when you enter a church and you see the frescoes on the wall, you see the icon, your state of prayer is can very easily be disrupted by by looking at the icon because then you begin to engage uh, the kind of rationalist faculty you're engaging and you're no longer praying but you're looking at maybe a mistake in the icon or what's perceived as a mistake you're not looking at it um you're not seeing it you're looking right it's the same thing when you're engaged with when you're speaking with someone you love you're not looking, you're seeing them. Because looking, you begin to see the, you know, the mole or the imperfection. And that pulls you out of being in communion with the person. It's the same thing with history, the same thing with life, same thing in regards of, 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 of experiencing communion on any level. And so when, so in, in, a, in a state of revelation, um, it's the opposite of this hyper, you know, myopic, divided, dichotomy of looking at a detail yes that yes. the digital age and and really you know there's that phrase the devil's in the details that's a, that's another way of kind of explaining 
what I'm trying to say here. So it's kind of both and, but more towards the broader stroke. So for sure. my, but that's how I would see it. Father Zachariah, do you have anything to add? I mean, I, yeah, I would, th I think that, I don't know what, I mean, in that, in those times, it's a, it's, it's a mystery, you know, what will happen then, but I think we'll, we'll just know there's a certain knowing that's going to be that, that we can't comprehend right now because we're just not there, but all of a sudden, as you, you referenced and, um, that everything is going to come to light. God will, God will illumine everything. And and everyone in that moment will 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 just there'll be a knowing like Father Turbo was saying a a seeing that that completely transcends what we believe to be most of the time looking on this <laughs> on this earth um, and and all of a sudden we will see there won't be any blinders there won't be any I mean whether or not that necessarily comes down to every little detail is is I think secondary but. We'll, we'll see the whole system, the whole thing that was for what it was and for what it, you know, I'll say what it like. was because it'll be gone at that point. Um, and I think people that we, had given their hearts to it and believed in it because we believe in something. We give our hearts to something. That's just what we do as humans. And, yeah. and, and, and all this, that system will be gone. Um, and and it'll, it'll be seen for the, and understood for all of its trickery, its deceit because it was demonic. Um, yeah so. no absolutely and that that's kind of it's not like i'm gonna look over at my jerk co-worker and be like told you <laughs> right, you know right. like oh, i told you the whole <laughs> thing <laughs> was <laughs> fake like yeah no it's i i think i'll be much too worried about what's being revealed about me at that yeah, point so it's gonna be, it's, it's so great, let's wrap up cool. yeah um let's wrap up i'll ask a quick little icebreaker question on the way out um you had mentioned having some father Zachary had at least some experience, uh, passing experience with like punk or whatever, correct? Surfing. Yeah. Surfing. Grunge. grunge. I was a grunger. Do you remember your first show? Your first show you went to? I, I went to small. Yeah. I went to local concerts. Um, I don't, I don't remember. I mean, uh, what would have been the first, there was a few shows. I mean, uh, I, I don't exactly. I, you know, I didn't go to a whole lot of concerts because I I, I was a I tried to go to the beach to surf most. That was most of my priority, sure. um, and, and those kind of things. But I went to a few concerts. Yeah, um, more local. Look, I don't even remember the band's names. Sure, but the kind of yeah. band in that um, vein of things. <laughs> Father, what about you, Father Turbo? I think my first concert was uh, it was Depeche Mode, Let's Red, and I think um, I think it was uh, Pine as a Revenge. I think it was, which is Peter Hook's band from um, Joy Division and New Order. That was my first concert. That is quite the concert. Um, that my is. Sister, my sister took me to that, but my first kind of show. Um, I think my first show was a Violent Outrage, which was a local punk band. Violent <laughs> Outrage. Um, Sounds chill. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was, it was a. <laughs> they were, it was a local punk show, Violent Outrage, and I can't remember who else um, they were playing with. But that was like my first kind of like show, like punk show. So, yeah. I think my first concert, not counting some of the like kind of hokey christian protestant like carmen or whoever growing <laughs> up like yeah. yeah yeah i think besides him i think my first concert i think was uh cake and flaming lips my where my mom and my aunt levy both love cake and so we're kind of a cake family and i that was one of the first bands i really got into uh but my first show i think was probably cornerstone the christian music mm -hmm. Films festival mm -hmm. in bushnell mm -hmm. that was probably my first show show of like i didn't know who the band was they were playing stuff there was a like 20 person mosh pit like that type of thing so like uh i think that was like my first actual show show so i'll probably uh in about an hour that's oh, not true i definitely went to the show in columbia you know whatever so anyway Father uh, Zachariah, thank you so much yeah, thank you father for coming pleasure. On. Appreciate thank you, you. Thank god it's um thank you I your insight was valuable. Thank you very, very much. Like it's uh I think that um 
I think it's, it'll be a good, it'll be a good spot for people to kind of understand a lot more context about the conflict, what's happening over there and stuff. Um, so usual plugs, uh, anytime we mention a show or a, an artist. Well, father, do you have anything that you want to plug? Just oh, real quick for leave. thank you. Absolutely. What was the name of your blog? One more time. Um, ink, the inkless pen. So dot okay. blog. Yep. It's we'll have we'll have a link to it sure. in the in the show notes, you know. Um okay. yeah. Okay. Um but no, besides that, no, it was just uh, great to be here and hopefully, yeah, just I'll plug keep keep praying for our brothers, our suffering brothers and sisters all over the you know, Kosovo, Ukraine. It's not just in Ukraine, so you know, it's just everywhere we got and we suffer in different ways in the West, right? Currently, right now, we have a different kind of temptation um mm. and martyrdom that we have to face as it were because martyr means to be a witness mm -hmm. uh, to christ and so we're all called to called to martyr to be martyrs for christ whether that means we'll be laying down our bodies um, necessarily god knows but we have to stand fast in the faith so but pray for those that are are suffering and hopefully uh we can we can maintain love love even for our enemies love even for those that hate and despitefully use us which is the hallmark of a true Christian. Exactly. We have to remain Christian and human, just human um, through everything. There's a real temptation. Just all end on this, sorry. This, this always scares me. There's a lot of things that scare me in the scriptures. But he says, because the love of many grow cold, because of lawlessness will abound, mm. the love of many will grow cold. Mm. And I think that's a real temptation. We see such lawlessness and and the uh, the spiritual effect that Christ warns us about is a, a cooling. I just grow cold. I grow numb. I grow insensitive because it's too much. It's just overwhelming. It's too much. So it's just easier um, not to love anymore. But if we can, the well, what we really need to do is enter into divine love because only Christ has a heart that inc can encompass everything. Um, and if we can dwell in Christ, then we can participate in that. So let's guard our hearts. Let's not let the lawlessness of the day um, cause our hearts to grow cold. Um, and let's let's pray for for everyone. And that you know, even um, you know, just every you know, all of it. Let's pray for um, Patriarch Bartholomew. Let's pray for Epiphany and the the schismatics that they would find repentance. That that you know, the Lord does. He, you know, he died on the cross even for them. I mean, mm. if we if we can remember that that when we celebrate Pascha, even though they're persecuting the church right now, when Christ dies on on Good Friday, on Holy Friday coming up, of course for Orthodox, um, you know, to almost two weeks out for us, but he for them also, even for those that are persecuting, he he died for the Especially for them. exactly yeah. all of Especially us. For them. So let's let's remember that and that's the heart we have to bear that they would well will god bring that well that's god it's um but we can we can long for that or at least try to cultivate that let's let's guard our hearts against the lawlessness and the coldness that seems to really be um a temptation in our times anyway god have mercy man what a great word father that's uh yeah forget my usual plugs you can listen to another episode if you want those plugs we're gonna end on that so thank you everyone thank you thank father god. for the word Thank you. Thank you. Father. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. You got the record, Father.